Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I am thrilled to be hosting an old friend, an old client, Sanjay Nath. Welcome to the show, Sanjay. Thank you, but who are you calling old? <laughs> old friends. I'm oh, okay. very specific about how I use that. Uh, today, we're talking about how to create a long-term strategy. Tell everybody what age you were and how long you have been in this business. Uh, January 8th, 1995. That was my first presentation. Um, the story goes like So I've been doing this just a little over 27 years. Wow. And yeah, I, I started off in one market. I've kind of evolved into another, but I still play in the first market because the phone keeps ringing. So um, when you were 19 years old, is that when you first gave your first paid speech? That is correct. And so if you did the math, you know that I'm now 47. <laughs> I'm 58, so let's not go. talk about that. Um, so you were 19 and your first market was, and talk about how we started working together too, because I totally forgot about it. <laughs> okay, so I'll ramble on. So the story goes like this. Um, I was studying engineering, I'm pretty me, engineering at, uh, at, in university. And when I graduated high school, I was super involved. I was like valedictorian and student council president and played volleyball and ran the school store and had a high 90 hour. I was one of those kids. Yeah. And so I was studying engineering and the new president of student council, two years removed from me, called me up and said, we want you to come back and talk to people with the benefits about getting involved. And uh, they said, we'll pay you to speak. And I went, You'll pay me to speak. Normally people pay me to shut up. This is good. And so I kind of started doing backflips in, in my house where I was uh, with the students I was living with. And the one girl I was living with said, what are you so excited about? I'm like, you want to pay me to speak? And she said, well, what are you going to speak on? I, I don't know, getting involved in leadership. And, and she's like, well, I coach a swim team. Why don't you come and talk to the swim team? And I was like, okay. So I go meet the head coach of the swim team. It's a competitive swim team in Kingston, Ontario. And the coach says to me, he goes, this stuff is great, but it sounds like more than a one-shot deal. We want you to do a weekly series. And I was like, okay. So I'm 19 years old. And next thing I realized, I'm speaking to eight to 10-year-olds about goal setting and dealing with your parents and communication and setting your sights on the Olympic. And I was waking up 6.30 Saturday mornings to do this. Now understand, I was a 19-year-old kid in, in college. And so I would go out and I would come in at like 1.30 in the morning and I would start writing my talk. And 6.30 in the morning, I would deliver it. And what would happen is- Not to do it, people. We're talking about how to create a long-term strategy today. This is not the beginning. Of it. No, it's very sustainable. Absolutely. So what happened was older kids would sit in on the sessions. Yeah. And then at one point, parents started sitting in on the sessions. And this one gentleman came up to me afterward and said, that was wonderful. I run a youth group. Would you like to speak at the youth group? And I was like, all right. So I went and did that and I did a 45 minute session. Afterwards, he came up to me and he said, um, that was wonderful. And he gave me $45. And I was like, a dollar a minute? At this rate, I'll be rich. This is fantastic. Uh, but I actually, initially I refused it. It was one of my first big aha lessons. I refused, I said, no, I'm, just, I'm doing this voluntarily. And he said, no, I'm sorry. He goes, this is what we have money for. I'm sorry, we couldn't pay you more, it's worth more. And in that audience, there were some teachers and a teacher came up to me afterwards and that was great. How much do you charge to speak at schools? And I went, you can charge to speak at schools. <laughs> and in my 19 year old wisdom, I came up with the biggest number I could possibly think of. I said, I, ch I, ch I ch charge, I, ch I, ch I charge, ch ch charge $300. <laughs> now, 1995, I'm a 19 year old kid, $300. And she said, that sounds reasonable. We'd like to hire you. And my jaw just dropped. And I went and did that. And she actually invited a teacher from another school to come and watch me. They liked it. They hired me. And the things just kind of snowballed from there. So fast forward, uh, 1995, 2005, 10 years into this, uh, I, I, that's when we first met. And I kind of approached you and said, look, it, I, I want to get busier. And I know you work with speakers and maybe you can help me and coach me. And, and I, want to, I want to get more into this youth market. And, and you said to me, you know what? Sounds great. You're on a wonderful path and I'd love to help you. But I don't know enough about that market to really help you. And you said something along the lines of, if you ever get into the corporate world, mm -hmm. let me know. Okay. And 2008, fast forward three years from there, I had a kid call me up and said, I have your business card from eight years ago during orientation week at college. I now work for this bank. What can you do? 
And so that was my first kind of corporate big, big gig. And then I went to you and I said, okay, I'm corporate now, help me. And you actually helped me significantly with uh, articulating my brand and, and which is an idea and a concept that I, uh, you, you helped me walk through the process and it, I'm still using to this day. So. I have a lot of uh, people in the youth market today because I think I've gotten a lot more confident about it. And what I recognize now too, Sanjay, and you don't know this, so we're catching up. We haven't seen each other in quite a, quite a long time. Uh, what you don't know is what's changed about my coaching is yes, we coach on tactics, but we also talk a lot about mindset. And so back in the day, had I coached you in the youth market, I would have said, okay, I think this is what the market will bear based on people that I know in that market who are at the top of the range and kind of encouraged you to continue to grow your confidence and ask for more. One of the things that you did, so this is a part of your long-term strategy, you did what I would call is be good marketing. The first swim team, somebody said, hey, this guy's good, let's get him to do this. Like everything that you have done over your 27 year career has spin has spin spun off into something else. Yeah, uh, and, and by the way, just back to the, the, the coaching piece, to me, actually, that um, is something that really showed integrity for me, was you said, you know what, I'd love to help you, but in, at that time, you weren't an expert or I you couldn't create the value. And yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the things that, that's important, even from the speaking or the coaching world, is yeah. if you can't create the value, and if you can only do a 7 out of 10 for the client, but you have a colleague or even a competitor that can do a 9 out of 10, you yeah. should be referring that business. Because the customer remembers, and more importantly, the value is created. So this kind of leads us down a place that we don't entirely agree, but we kind of agree, is that when you first started out in the world of speaking, I think you likely were like a generalist, right? If somebody said, can you do this? You were kind of searching your way and trying to figure out where you wanted to specialize. Is that right? 100%. And yeah, we do very slightly, but it's okay because you're entitled to your wrong opinion. And <laughs> Uh, and, and, and you know what the conventional wisdom is, is this idea of specialization, which I'm all for and niching um, my uh, and, and I think that's where you have the greatest opportunities. And that's where you actually not only the greatest opportunities to create business and make money, but to fill your soul. Because if you're doing something and you're chasing the hot topic, you might make a few bucks or whatever, but I think you burn out. Yeah. Uh, but where, where I kind of spin it slightly differently is I go, I believe that people when they first start, they don't know enough to niche. So they don't know, for example, that this particular market of left-handed female golfers existed. And, and they would never even have thought of it. And they got in front of three of those audiences and they resonated at a level. And those people are singing their praises and giving them standing ovations for 17 hours and what have you. And so that's why I believe initially, People should be saying yes to everything to figure out what the niche exists that they best so, fit. So let's uh, also clarify some language here. So I talk about picking a lane. And when we talk about picking a lane, we really are talking about like what topic, what do you want to be known for five years from now? But then there's also this idea of a niche. And to me, that's a target market. That's a group of people that you're going to maybe drill down on. Are we on the same page about that? Sure. Uh, yeah. Right okay, so. Sorry, wait a second. When you said to you know, pick a lane, uh, is Elaine cute? And is she single? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Oh my gosh. Down the rabbit hole we go. Okay. Hey, you, can, you can edit that out later. Don't worry about it. No, no, no. no. We don't edit. I forgot all to right. tell you. We don't edit the podcast, so it's all good. Um, so when it let's talk about when you decided what your lane was going to be and what it is today like when did you start to identify who your market was you've got a you've got a philosophy called 1080 10 i want to hear about that when exactly did everything start to come together for you i know work in the youth market they can really work you hard yeah uh so again so the youth market people would you know, back then it was a lot of, uh, and in today's day language, we use Black Lives Matter. Back then it used to be called anti-discrimination or uh, 
racism. And, and so that was a topic. And then there was uh, bullying was kind of up and around there. And then there was leadership. And then there was drinking and driving speakers. And so anytime I had an opportunity, I was saying, yes, 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 yes. Because I didn't know what I didn't know. And then later, it was probably around the time, you know, this is a shameless plug for you. But when I really actually started to hone in was working with you. And that was probably I was 10 years into the business. Now, I don't think people need to take 10 years to start niching. I think that's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slow learner, I, I admit. Um, to be clear, to pick a lane, they don't need to take 10 years. But it, it's not uncommon in the youth market, I think, for somebody to be a little bit more of a jack of all trades. Right, yeah, 100%. Um, and so it was, in fact, and, and I've seen it in your book and stuff, but you have this pretty little chart and I'm a numbers guy and I like charts. and. And it, basically what you made me do is you said, and again, we're going back 13 years and we haven't talked about this since, but you said, what are all the topics you could possibly speak on credibly? Yeah, and then you're like, hard. what's the market? What's the potential to make money? What's it, whatever, all this sort of, and it was just a simple add them up, multiply, do a weighted average. And that kind of allowed me to see some of the stuff that I wasn't really a superstar at ranked low. And then when I kind of had that reflection, I went, it ranks low, but I realized that I didn't get the same stomach, the same excitement level uh, yeah. when someone would call me and ask me to do something on drinking and driving, yeah. right? And, and, and so what I, I learned to do is more around the leadership piece of it and making smart choices. So after that, when someone said, hey, I'm looking for a drinking and driving speaker, I would say, I don't do drinking and driving. Um, you know, I got a friend, Matt, he does a great job with that. But if you're looking for someone to talk about choices specifically, yeah then I can do that. And sometimes they say to me, oh, that's perfect. We want you and choice is great. Or they go, no, we're looking for someone. And I go, great, match your guy. Okay, that's really good. That, and I think that's helpful to people who, who uh, because a lot of times I think you can align what it is that you offer to what their needs are. There's often some common ground somewhere in the, in the middle that you can figure it out. Okay, so let's talk about 108010 because I do think we might have been working together either um, right before that happened or something, but the 108010 thing idea, tell, tell everybody what the concept is and how that has evolved. Like you're kind of sometimes putting your stake in the ground and saying, this is my philosophy, this is my formula, and that was what 108010 was for you. Yeah, so 108010 um, is, is a brand. And what is it? It's all about focusing on your strength. So I'll give a, a one minute overview. So 108010 says, you know, any group of people can sub, be subdivided into three groups, top 10%, bottom 10%, majority 80%. Top 10 wants to be there. Bottom 10 has to be there. Majority 80 falls whoever's more empowered. So the classic example I like to use is if you've ever been to a musical and ended up giving a standing ovation to a performance that you didn't really think deserved a standing ovation, that's 108010 at work. Why? What happened? So you were a majority 80 person sitting in the audience, you, you were swayable, and you ended up sitting next to the lead role's mother. So the, the program finishes, she's what's a top 10, she's empowered, she jumps up, she yells, she screams, she's throwing flowers, and out of social obligation, out of not wanting to be rude, you stand up and you, you, you're clapping along too. And so that, that's kind of how it, how it is. Now, where did they come from? Every time I read a leadership book or a personal development video or anything, I found certain themes kept on coming up time and time again. And this notion of focusing on your strengths were set in various different forms. And so what I, I literally did is like, I pulled together a couple of hundred of these ideas um, from like Pareto principle and Jack Welch's differentiation and Newton's third law and, and like put them all together and kind of came up with this articulation. When I was working with you, this is when the epiphany of kind of putting it together actually all came together. So I was... I actually looked at, at the time, I looked at the Seven Habits brand, Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. And I looked at, I, I said, there's a lot of things there that I really liked. Specifically, it was, it had an, um, an intuitive buy-in. You didn't need research to convince people, right? So people would, there were very simple concepts. If someone bought into it and latched onto it, here's, here's the key, was they tapped into their own inner genius. They got the results. And they figured it was actually the content, but it really isn't the content. The content just unleashes what's within you. And so that was what I was trying to do with this 108010 brand was to try to create an idea a la seven habits that people would hear it, they get it, and it represents something bigger, which just taps into their own, own inner genius. And, 
And then I, I apply it to sales, I apply it to culture. Um, and, and like you're saying, you saying, you put your stake in the ground and that's what I've done. So over the years doing presentations, people have often asked me to speak on presentation training. And so presentation training wasn't in my realm, but I could do presentation training from a 1080-10 perspective. So what I say is everyone has a top 10. And for example, I'm a sarcastic smart ass. And so when you see, I thought I would try something new. Um, and, and, and actually one of probably the, one of the best compliments I ever received for speaking wasn't even meant to be a compliment. My ex-mother-in-law came to see me speak for the first time and she went home and she went, oh, he's the same on stage as he is off stage. Yeah, that is a good compliment. It is a great compliment. Yeah. So, but, but I, what I do is I try to help people find their top 10, which means if you're an emotional tree hugger, you shouldn't be sarcastic. And if you are, you know, if you're a statistic driven numbers freak, then you should be a statistics number driven numbers freak. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You want to embrace it. That's your top 10. Right. So I apply, I try to apply it to everything. I like that. Okay. And, and I like that that's served you so well. Um, let's talk a little bit because we, we've called this session, how to create a long-term strategy. Now, I would love to know something that you wish you would have known way back at the beginning. What what would you have would you have looked up at that ten thousand foot level more often to maybe? This is one of the things you know. I go once a quarter to my coach, and it's incredibly helpful to just rise up to that ten thousand foot level and and see what's going on in your business. What, what would you say that you would wish you would have done sooner? Oh, many things. Um, I wish I'd understood the philosophy. I mean, there's a bunch of, a bunch of philosophies I wish I understood. One is I talk myself out of so much money. <laughs> I, I was the king of, I charge, I charge this, but you probably don't have that. So let me do it with this. I, you know, I, I was horrible that way. And I love your fee, by the way, uh, your fee in Canada. Can I say what it is? Absolutely. $10,000. A lot of people in Canada had a perception at one time that in order to get 10K, you needed to be some best selling author or have some status. And uh, I do believe that mindset is a huge part of what's possible. And I'm seeing 10, and I'm seeing 12, and I'm seeing 15, and I'm seeing 20 for people who are not celebrities. So that's good news for Canadian speakers. And if you're in the US, of course, I want you to know that um, when I say to a speakers bureau that my client is 25K, they're like, oh, great. Because <laughs> they say, oh, I can make some money off of this. So uh, I'm glad you've gone there. Can I can I share a quick little story? Yes. Um, I, I I'm actually I'm I'm 15 now. I was 10 before. Oh, I'm up before. to 15. That's wrong. okay. Um, but I just recently had an experience where someone called me and said, you know, we want you to do this thing. You know, how much? It was it was a, a graduation for a college. Did we have you have 12 minutes? And they said, what's your fee? And I said 15. And one of the things I have I've always learned is you know you say your fee and you shut up. And if there's silence. You kind of you know do a follow-up question and that's what i got sounds so well what's the budget and i'm thinking they're going to say it's a bag of doritos <laughs> and she says 50. <sighs> at which point i was like when you have 50 grand for yeah. a 12 minute presentation you are going celebrity yeah right and and they ended up they ended up using a celebrity which is fine but yeah. how often do our does our own perception kind of jump in Oh, oh, they they're only gonna give me a bag of Doritos. Oh, it's not gonna, but they had 50 grand in the uh in, in the budget. So, right. so by the way, going back to that, you know, what, what's one of the things uh, I wish I'd known? I used to think one speak, I call them speaks, by the way. I've always called them speaks. I th used to think one speak makes or breaks you, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I used to think only if I got this one opportunity, then life would be good. Or if I mess this up, life is over. It's not. One speak right. does not make or break you. That's funny. Vince and I used to joke about that. So I managed a speaker named Vince Pacente out of Dallas and he would call after an engagement and he would say, everything has changed. <laughs> like, because one speak was going to make or break. Right. And we would joke and laugh about it because really it was all just like an incremental thing. 
there are some gigs that have really good spin-off potential. Let's be clear on that. Um, but if you get a TED Talk, it may not change your life. It may change your life or it may not change your life. And you know, the odds are probably leading in favor of not. So thank you. So one speak will not make or break you. Uh, let's talk about one bomb for one speak. That's what I mean, make or break. You won't okay. break you. One bomb, like, unless there are very few exceptions. Uh, and one of the exceptions that comes to my mind is Michael Kramer, the guy that, uh, uh, not Michael Kramer, Cosmo Kramer, uh, uh, Michael Richards, Michael yeah. Richards. Yeah. There's an example. When you have such a high, when you start so high and you, you can crash and burn in front of, front of an audience when you have the world looking at you. Yes. When you're like rude and offensive and you make really poor choices. Yeah. Totally. But for most people, if you get in front of an audience and you bomb. Yeah. And, and if you do this long enough, it, you will bomb because yeah. at some point, and there's different degrees of bombing, you will bomb. It will not destroy your career. No. And, and please know for those of you who a, a, a part of your strategy for coming back from something like that. And I, I've given this to one of my highest paid speakers, hottest, 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 you know, seven figure earner. Um, when you bomb one of the, one of the tactics I'm going to say is to actually have your next speech just really, really focus on the audience. Make it about them and not you. Because if your thought going into that audience is, oh no, you know, I just bombed, what's this gonna be, I'm no good, and all of that, that is not gonna lead, that's gonna lead you down to a very dark path and you're gonna go into it with uncertainty. But when you focus on the audience instead of yourself, don't you find that that just kind of alleviates all that nonsense talk that we say to ourselves? 100%. Uh, and, and it's, I, I'm gonna go even higher. Forget the next talk. You should be doing that every talk. I mean, ultimately, if you want sustainability, if you wanna create value, and you know, I believe that you should be creating value and getting paid handsomely for doing so. So if you create more value, you should make more money. And one of the best ways to create value is not to go do, you know, personal therapy on the stage. Yeah. It's, it's a matter of what is most helpful for these people, what's going to move them forward, whether it's personally or professionally or a combination of both or financially or spiritually or depending on your topic. And when you come from that place, even if you do find yourself messing up or there's a technical glitch or whatever, people will give you so much rope and so much slack because they can, they can smell it. If you're genuinely there to try to help them and something goes awry, they still will support you. And so it, it, it helps both ways. So it should be after every bomb, but after every success uh, as well. I love it. You know, inside the Wealthy Speaker School, we give both tactics and strategy. So we're kind of helping people with their long-term vision of their business and really, you know, what are some of the bigger picture goals but I'm gonna also add to that, that we also have woven mindset through the whole thing. And I, I really do believe that your confidence and your mindset kind of need to build and grow as you grow. Talk a little bit about um, speakers needing tactics versus strategy. Well, I mean, you know, strategy, let's define them. To me, strategy is the big levels, the 10,000 foot view. It's yeah. the path in which you're going. Uh, sorry, it's not even the path. It's, it's more the, the destination. And then yeah. tactics, tactics are the, are the path. It's we're going down this street and then that street and that. And one of the observations I've found, and I've had the opportunity to, to mentor speakers uh, along this road in, in over the past years. And I find that when people come into this newish or newer-ish, they tend to think they need, uh, they need tactics. They're like, no, no, I just, I just need someone to make the phone ring. I'm just going to show up uh, and, and, and speak. Oh, just tell me what the tagline is to get more business. Okay. And, and, and they often get overwhelmed because the tactics aren't as obvious when the strategy is not there. Right. And so we tend to, you know, the, the cliche, if you go to the NSAs and the capses of the world, people go, I was like drinking from a fire hose. And the reason you feel that is because strategically, you don't know where you're going to be. So mm -hmm. one tactic says, if you're down this strategy, go this way. The other Another tactic says go the opposite way, but that's because you're using a different strategy. Mm -hmm. So what I find is when I started going to conventions and learning and becoming a student of the game, 
uh, I was looking for tactics, but I ended up learning strategy. And once you kind of get a strategy and you own the strategy, that's the other thing too. You may have this great strategy, but you don't feel like it's aligned with you or you don't really feel it's authentic. And But once you own the strategy, all of a sudden your shoulders kind of drop back and then you go to these ideas and these conventions and these gatherings and these meetings and you pick up a little tactic here and there. And, and that's where you thing. get the benefit, sorry. You're looking for one thing. You're looking for one idea. Oh yeah, that's it. That's all I needed. Um, yeah. I mean, a quick little example of, of that. Someone said, uh, I was at a meeting, I don't know, a year or two ago, maybe I don't know, five years ago, whatever. Um, and they said, in your LinkedIn profile, you should always write your email address. Because if, if someone's not connected to you, they, they would have to become your friend and then you'd have to accept it. And if they want to reach out to you for whatever reason, your, your address is there, boom, put it there. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. But that's a little tactic. That doesn't change your speaking business. But if you have a pathway and you know where you want to go, then those tactics really become helpful. That's interesting. Um, let me just throw some more mud into the water here because one of the analogies that um, a coach gave me was, and this is how we sell the Wealthy Speaker School now, was that when, let's say you were baking a batch of chocolate chip cookies, and I'm sure you have something funny to say about that, but you're, you, um, uh, it, and we're comparing kind of the, the batch of chocolate chip cookies to starting a speaking business. Well, <clears throat> you wouldn't go out onto the internet and search 10 different recipes and then take a little piece of each recipe, take one ingredient from each recipe and put it together and make your own you'd actually follow a recipe. And so we have a recipe, ready, aim, fire. Whereas most people, one of the biggest problems, I think in the speaking business is that people are piecemealing together their tactics and their strategies and they're not following one recipe. And so just to kind of drive that home, I think that, um, well, now I'm hungry and I'm interested in going to, you know, it, that, that point that you make, I actually do a program where I, it's a, an interactive thing. When I get people to solve a logic puzzle and it's actually an individual logic puzzle, like it's a, it's a one person thing, but I get them to do groups of four or five and they actually have chips and they physically have to like slide and move chips over. And what I find is because there's one set of chips, you get people doing what I call hungry, hungry hippo hands. So someone starts doing, someone goes, no, let me try it. No, let me try it. And they're, they're fighting for the chips. And so the language I use to the exact same point is what happens is they're bastardizing the solution. Mm. They're not going down one pathway to see if this one works or doesn't work, but they keep hijacking. They go down this path and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. And it's not a very efficient path. You might get to the end, but yeah, if you have something that works, but I, I'm going, if we can, I love analogy. So let's keep big digging on the, on the cookie analogy. Before you even look for the recipe, there are certain things, strategies that you need to be aware of. For example, you may want peanut butter chocolate chip cookies, or the flip side, you may be allergic to peanut butter. So that's the strategy before you start looking for the tactics. You have to go, what is it, the big picture that I'm looking for? Oh, I want it because I'm going to a, to a dinner party. Oh, the dinner party, well, I shouldn't have nuts in it because so many allergies to nuts. Or... You know, I'm going to my BFF and they are obsessed with peanut butter. So I totally need. So you need the strategy before you can get the tactics. And then once you get the tactics, you want to have a blueprint that has a proven record of success so that you don't bastardize the solution and you get there as efficiently as possible. This was like, we just mashed together like 14 analogies into one conversation. Sanjay Nath, I always love talking to you and I have loved watching your 27 year trajectory in this business. Um, I'm excited for you and where you are today. If people wanna get in touch with you, how should they connect with you on LinkedIn? What, what, what's the best way to get that, do that? To, to get in touch with me is just email me, which is my, my email, it's sanjay at sanjaynath.com. And I'm assuming you're going to pop that up or my name shows up somewhere. Um, but no, yeah, no, no, my no, website no. is my name, sanjaynath.com. Or if you get like a star foam cup and a really long string and then give me the other end, we can, we can talk. We can Go talk. low tech. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. By the way, I just want to put in a plug for the Wealthy Speaker School. We have just opened up 
uh, a new kind of pricing to our school that has become an absolute no-brainer. So if you know any speakers who are looking to get on the path and to earning that first 100K in speaking, definitely make sure that you check out wealthyspeakerschool.com. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Sanjay, for being here. And with that, we will say, see you soon, wealthy speakers. Bye for now.